please welcome to the stage, James O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Stop. Enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and, and welcome to the Leicester Square Theatre for tonight's full disclosure. And I start with some apologies to everybody who, who submitted a question for me to answer, given the, the rigmarole of getting into the theatre and the rather tight schedule of, of tonight's guests. We're going to cut straight to the chase. Um, but first, a little bit of bad news to share with you. I've, I've spoken to the management here at, at the Leicester Square Theatre, and I've explained that, that, that the audience here this evening will be a, a particularly... Um, civilised and obedient bunch, but nevertheless they are insisting that Article 7 of the Leicester Square Theatre's terms and conditions will have to remain in place this evening, so um, that means no moshing, <laughs> no stage diving, and I, I got off to a very bad start with Keir Starmer because um, also no crowd surfing tonight, so <laughs> I know he, he was particularly looking forward to launching himself towards the back of the room, but we'll do our best to make him feel welcome anyway, um, or at least you will. Ladies and gentlemen, Keir Starmer. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, that's <laughs> <in> the <class. laughs> Thank you very much. Um, do you like talking about yourself? I'm getting used to it. Um, it's not. It's funny. I grew up, um, and um, you stop talking about your mum and dad by the time you sort of grow up, and now everybody's interested in what your mum and dad like. Mm. Um, so it's a very odd thing where um, you have to talk about yourself. You have to explain who you are, where you come from. You never. You haven't you. struck me, and tonight might change this. You, you don't strike me as a natural show off. No. Apart from on the football page. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to show off anymore. A, a trickster. But you don't, you're, not, you're not someone that... Some barristers do. I mean, some, some barristers are, are great performers, very uh, a, extrovert. But you, you don't come across as someone who, who loves the spotlight for the sake of the spotlight. No, not for the sake of the spotlight. Have you been surprised and, and even perhaps disturbed by the level of scrutiny that you've been exposed to since becoming leader? Because people probably don't realise or have forgotten that, that you were barely in Parliament for 10 minutes before you were being talked of as a, as a potential leader, and then not long after that you were leader. And the, so you've gone from essentially a public figure as, as DPP, but the level of scrutiny and the attention of right-wing media in particular must have been quite unnerving. Yeah, and it's really escalated. So I went into Parliament in 2015. Um, seems like another world now. Yes, doesn't it? Um, well, it was. You know... Um, <laughs> Ed Miliband was our leader. Uh, oh, David Cameron was Prime Minister. The word Brexit hadn't been invented. Uh, we did COVID wasn't a word we'd better heard of. Yeah. A whole lot has changed uh, since then. But the scrutiny is pretty immediate yes. uh, once you're in. And then it just gets more and more and more. And, um, you know, uh, you do get used to it to some extent, but I don't think you ever really get used to it. You, 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 I mean, you can expect it and you can know that it's coming, but until it actually happens... You mentioned Ed Miliband. I remember when they went after his, his dead father for being, mm. a, for being a, a, a traitor to the country. There, there is a level that no-one else really has to deal with, except perhaps the leader of the Labour Party in this country. There is, and it's... I remember that with Ed, and it was obviously very personal after mm. his dad, and it hurt him a lot. And all of us have to try to manage that side. And I think the family is the hardest bit of all. Um, one of the things uh, Vic, my wife, and I have talked about is never putting our kids in the public domain. So there are very few pictures of our children. I don't ever use their names um, when I'm out and about. I say I've got a boy who's 13 and a girl who's 11, and they are absolutely fantastic. But you do, you do use their names when you're out and about with them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I say, boy 13, stop doing that. <laughs> girl 11, put that down. Well, as long as you don't leave them in the pub, I suppose you'll be doing better than the other fella. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you. <laughs> this is why I keep getting COVID, you see, I actually spend time with my kids. <laughs> yes, I don't know, exactly that. <laughs> So, so, all right, we're, we're, and you know how many you've got as well. There we go. <laughs> all right. And that, our thirteen-year-old boy is thirteen and a half now. Is 
just got to about the same height as me. He shot up um, in the last sort of, six, nine months. And, he's, and I'm sort of almost pointing up at him, saying, you're not going to do that again. And he's looking down, <laughs> saying, you're not going to be saying that to me much longer. <laughs> Whole new ball game. Did, 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 I mean, were there moments when you talked about going into politics in particular and running for the leadership, um, specifically when, when your wife said, don't? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she was looking at all the other jobs I could have done yes. um, that I could have gone into. Um, and um, I mean, she's 100% behind what we're doing. But it, it's a, you know, you do put yourself on the line. You're under a huge amount of scrutiny. But the point of it is to get in there and do something about it. And, you know, I've spent my whole life sort of wanting to bring about change and just reach the decision, um, you know, by 2015 that you can't really bring about change if you don't go into politics and if you don't go into government, because going into politics isn't good enough. Mm. I've been in opposition now for, this is the seventh year. Um, and in opposition, you're not really changing anything. Um, and, you know, this is burnt on me. I, I, in my first year as an MP, 2015 to 2016, I voted 172 times. And I lost 171 times. We go round and round the voting lobbies. You had a slightly better and record as a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it is so frustrating. Yeah. You're there, you know, you can tweet about it, you can put stuff on social media, but you're not changing lives because you only change lives if you're in government. And so there's a real frustration. When did that first kick in, that, 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 that appetite for change, that desire to actually change things? For me as yeah. a person, way, way back when I was a youngster, I joined the Labour Party as soon as I could. How old were you when you joined? Age 16. 16. The East Surrey Young Socialists. Um, oh, it's quite there, a small group. There are only four of us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was immediately promoted to an officer position. Because, <laughs> and I think I got two it's on history day History repeating one. itself, isn't it? <laughs> Just you and Michael Gove then, I imagine, was it? <laughs> in his, in his, sorry. Um, but you were named Keir for the, for the first parliamentary uh, leader of the Labour Party. So, I mean, there was a bit of destiny, perhaps. Yeah, obviously I can't take any credit no, no, for you that. Can't. <laughs> um, but yeah, my mum and dad... Call me Kia, and um, it's one of those names that, when you're growing up, you don't really like it sure. because you just want to be called, you know, James mm. or Steve or Dave, because of, if you've got anything unusual Boris. about your name, <laughs> 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 I'm not sure I'll go that far. Um, so, but then you know, as you know, as I've got older, it's one of those names where most people can just call you by your first name, and yeah. um, you know. Um, you know, who they're talking like about. Like Madonna or, or, or Cher. <laughs> <laughs> Got that brand recognition. Yeah, along those lines. But your middle name was, was Rodney, na named after your dad. Yeah. It's a good job they put them that way around, isn't it? Yeah, really? it's a but, very good uh, job they put them that way around. Did that, did that come out at school? Because you'd have been in the, in, the, in the heyday of Only Fools and Horses. Was it, were, were you, was it known? No, <laughs> I kept that pretty quiet, yeah. um, <laughs> if you can believe. Um, so, no, here was the name. So let's, let's start um, at home. Born in Southwark, but moved pretty quickly to Southwark. Southwark only... I mean, this is an interesting one. Everyone yeah. says you were born in South London, Southwark. I was only born in Southwark because I was born in Guy's Hospital because my mum was very, very ill all her life, and it was a bit... You know, whenever she did anything, particularly having kids, it's all a bit touch and go. So we were unusually, for the time, in a way, born in hospital. So I was born in Guy's Hospital. But my claim to have been born in Southwark was about 24 hours of being in Guy's Hospital. <laughs> before we went back home uh, to Oxton. Which was home for all of your childhood. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what sort of house was it? What was it? It was a very modest house, um, semi-detached in her screen just outside Oxted. Um, three bedrooms, so um, I shared... Four kids. Four kids, yeah. three bedrooms, so... Um, this sounds like Sadiq now. I was in a bunk bed <laughs> uh, all the time I was at home until I left home because in the room I was in with my brother, that's all we could fit in there. Uh, it's not a sob story, by the way. It's just that that's what it was like. We didn't think it was particularly unusual. But, uh, yeah, four children in a three-bedroom house and uh, four dogs. And a, and a small car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's quite crowded. That is very crowded. Um, that's very crowded. Uh, animals, big part of your particularly your mum's life. Mm. So my mum loved donkeys. Um, and <laughs> as, as each of the four children left home, 
we got replaced by a donkey. <laughs> so eventually, of course, she had four donkeys. <laughs> and I swear she was a lot happier in many respects <laughs> with the four donkeys that she had. But they loved donkeys, my mum and dad. Um, they looked after them. They rescued them. If ever they heard there was a donkey that was going to be sold for its meat abroad or something, they'd sort of get a trailer and a car and they'd go down to the port or the dock and outbid anybody and bring this extra donkey back home again. But they, they love their donkeys. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and, and were you and your siblings close? Was it, was it a sort of tight-knit group? You were the only one that passed the 11 plus. So. Yes, so I did the 11 plus and went off to grammar school and the others didn't. And that meant there was a bit of separation there because we yeah. were going in different directions, going to different schools, etc. Um, but we were reasonably close. We are quite close in age and... Um, you know, we did things together, we holidayed together, and, you know, we're still pretty close. What were you like at school? I, I, I presume passing the 11 plus uh, uh, and uh, voluntary aided selective grammar school that then became fee paying, but you got excused the fees because you were already there. Yeah, so I went to the grammar school. It was a, uh, it was a local authority yes. grammar school. And I was um, two or three years into that when the policy changed, they got rid of grammar schools. But um, my school and the local authority decided that for the boys, it was a boys' school, who'd already got there under the state system, they would um, see them through to the other end. So that's how I managed to stay there for the rest of my schooling. Were you a good student? I presume you were. I was all right. I was all right. Are I mean, it was right? a very odd place for someone like me. You, um, Why? Because you're coming into a grammar school, away from home, not with my siblings, um, and, you know... Things like learning Latin were very odd yes. for me. Playing rugby rather than football was very odd um, yeah. for me. I absolutely love football, and we played rugby at the school. So were you any good at rugby? I was all right. Yeah. I was a full-back, uh, which means you just basically stand on your own, you run waiting for some other forward to sort of come, get, <laughs> having broken through everybody else. Yes. This massive person sort of running towards you, and everyone just says, tackle him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I played football, really. Football was, was the thing. Uh, so not, not a straight-A student, then, or anything like that? No. Not precocious? No. OK. Were, were you popular? Did you have a lot of mates? I've got a lot of mates, and I've still got them from school. So one of my closest friends is someone I met at school, and we've been very, very close ever since. Um, and other people I know from school I'm still in touch with. I, I, I'm very loyal with friends. So where I've got a friend, whether it's school or uni or whatever it is, those friendships last. Um, and for me, they go back to school. And so I'm still in touch with quite a number of people from school, um, including, as I say, people very, very close to me. That's quite rare, isn't it, I think? Why do you think that is? What is it about you that, that makes that important to you? I've got a feel, fierce loyalty to my friends, and they have to me, and we've been through a, a lot together, ups and downs, um, et cetera, and that means a lot to me. Mm. It almost goes back to what you were saying in the first place about the scrutiny and the public gaze that's on you I find you know what I do when I'm not in that gaze is I spend time with the people I've known for a long 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 time and they don't give a damn what I do mm. for a living I mean they do in the sense they care for me but that's not what formed the, the friendship um, and that's that's a place I would go to I'd much rather go to the pub with my mates that I've known for years and years and years and years than I would go somewhere else with people I perhaps haven't known so long were so, you conscious of class? Because your dad was a toolmaker. He worked in a factory. Yeah. Your mum, when she could work, worked as a nurse. Presumably at grammar school, you're, you're knocking about with the, with the sons of lawyers and the sons of, of accountants and professionals. Were you conscious of that? I, I, I was. Not so much for myself, but through my dad. Yeah. Um, because he, my mum worked as a nurse, and she was really proud of that. She loved it. And she, um, you know, the NHS was her you know, livelihood, mm. her, her, her lifeline. But for he, he worked in a factory as a tool maker. He would have loved to have gone on to higher education, but couldn't because he needed to go out and start earning. He went into apprenticeship, became a tool maker. Tool makers, by the way, are very skilled engineers. Mm. Um, you know, it's a very, very skilled thing, but it's on the shop floor. You're operating machinery. You're in, you know, steel toe caps. You're in a, a gown. You've got swarf eager everywhere. It's dirty factory floor work. That's the nature of the beast. Um, and that's where he worked, day in, day out, really long hours, by the way. He started at eight in the morning till five. Uh, then he'd come home for his tea, as he called it. He'd go back six o'clock till ten o'clock. So Seriously? So really, really, that's five days a week. But he always felt, and this is the class thing, mm. 
he felt that people looked down on him because he worked in a factory. So he was always uncomfortable. If ever the conversation was, what do you do for a living? You could see him get uncomfortable because he thought people looked down on him because he worked in a factory. And he was right about that, by the way. Loads of people, did, they didn't appreciate, and they don't, still don't appreciate, this is skilled work, this is hard work. How did this that make you feel? To see that when you got to the age, like you mentioned, your boy now, 13 and a half, he'll be seeing things that you don't notice when you're six. Yeah, I, I, that's something I do think about a lot because my relationship with my dad was quite distant. Right. We didn't talk a lot. I could see what that meant to him and it had an impact on me. I'm not, if I'm honest, I don't know that I knew the impact at the time. Mm. You know, I went into the Labour Party, I did politics, eventually went into law to try and do something about justice and injustice and that was all bound up probably with that sense of my dad also some of what happened to my mum but it was a distant relationship and I'm now very conscious of being very close to my kids and wanting that relationship to be totally different. They will probably give an interview in 25 years say the worst thing about my dad was he always wanted to talk to us, know what we're doing. He didn't know Never our us alone. I wish he'd be like his dad. <laughs> Let's give us but it is, it is quite, it's one of the things about parenthood I don't think I quite expected was how you develop that relationship with your children and get mm. it right. And that made me rethink my relationship with my dad and how it was, in many respects, just too distant. And, well, hard not to be, given the hours he was putting in, even, even if there'd been... But he, wouldn't, he didn't like to talk much either. He didn't, okay. he didn't engage. I mean, my parents rarely had people round. I can't remember my dad. There was no room. That's, there was no room. <laughs> <laughs> no room for four dogs put most people on. <laughs> if we're the four dogs inside, the four dog is outside. Like, you know, Take a seat. Not, not, not a lot of room to shuffle. But he didn't, you know, I can't remember them really going out for meals and okay. things. Um, so it, it made him possibly sort of pull away. This, this sense of not being valued made him pull away. It makes me really understand when people talk about the dignity of work and the pride of work what they mean mm. because I saw that in my dad and how that he felt wasn't valued and how it affected him um, and shaped him and um, and I can see that very clearly now I'm not sure I, I'm not, I don't claim I saw this as clearly as I did sure. um, at the time but I can see it very very clearly now and the, the impact it's had on me and the way I want to be different with my children. So you wouldn't have big political discussions around the dinner table or anything no. like that? No, we didn't. Um, it wasn't that kind of household. I mean, you know, you'll have plenty of politicians who say, you know, I remember the days when my parents brought home X, Y and Z to mm. see me and we argued around the kitchen table, all the rest of it. What we talked about, particularly with my mum around the kitchen table, was really, really basic stuff. And this is very important now in terms of the focus I want for the Labour Party, which was education. Mm. Um, and have we got a decent education for our kids? Have they got a chance to get on in life? This meant a lot to my mum and dad, by the way. Um, they had a very strong sense of whatever the ups and downs of life, and there are always ups and downs, our kids will have better chances than we had. And that really comforted them, um, that their kids would have better chances than they had. I think we've lost that, by the way, now, I'm afraid. I think in the last 10 years, that's gone. Um, but it was, for them, it comforted them, it gave them pride, it made them feel they were contributing to a society where the next generation would have a better chance than they had. And it meant a huge, huge amount to them. And so we talked about education, we talked about you know, what job you might do. From um, quite an early age, you were, you were yeah, conscious of yeah. expectations. Once I got to grammar school, grammar school's at the 11 plus, it sort of puts you into a different category. And, yeah. and um, then we talked about going to university. Nobody in my family had been to university before. So this was a big thing as well, going to university. Um, and then going, even going into the law um, was sort of my parents' hand sort of pushing me into doing a decent job, get yourself a proper job. Um, I, I don't think I'd ever met a lawyer before I went to university. I didn't really understand what this was going to be, but they had obviously thought, you know, we don't want him mucking about in politics. No. <laughs> Let's get him into a decent... So you'd already developed political ambitions at that point? Not ambitions, no. Because no. I'm just trying to work out where it came from. I, I've got this general sense of, of it, 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 you, as an enemy of injustice, as a, as, a, as, a, as a champion of fairness, but where, 
Joining the Labour Party at 16 was quite an odd thing, or the Young Socialists was quite an odd thing. It wasn't his, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, anywhere, to be honest, Keir, it would have been quite young to do it. And, and you know, the, the political unions at university are often quite wonky and, and quite anarchy. Yeah. I, I never thought then that someone like me would ever be leader of the Labour Party. Right. It just And I say this to children now when I go to schools... Um, the, the biggest inhibitor sometimes is, is the individual themselves, mm. the sense of that's not a job that someone like me is going to be it's able to do. It's the likes of us, isn't it? It's not for yeah, the likes was, of look, us. Did, so I didn't, people, you know, if, sometimes when you get to lead the Labour Party, etc., people think, well, you must have been planning that all your life. Mm. Not true. It I just didn't um, occur to me that I could be leader of the Labour Party when I was a teenager. Um, and that's why I very happily went into law and then channeled that as a way of dealing with injustice but it was it was that sense from my parents that you know you've got the chance to go to university you've got the chance to be a lawyer you must take that chance um and their vicarious pride that they, they were part of something yes. which allowed me to do that there's a line i've read from your dad when you got your knighthood when he said they treated Keir like a lord and they treated us like a lord's mum and dad yeah my mum and dad they um they, guessing when I got the knighthood at Buckingham Palace, and, and to some extent, all of that was about them and the pride that they had in that. They turned up. Um, they, very typical of my mum and dad, I'm afraid. <laughs> they, they, by then, they got a Great Dane. <laughs> and the animals, the animals came first. My mum couldn't walk at that stage, so they had to take a car into Buckingham Palace, which was quite unusual, mm. because by then she'd lost the ability to walk. Um, and so they were, they've got this sort of beaten-up old Volvo with a Great Dane in the back, <laughs> which they've not cleared with security. <laughs> and they've driven to the gates of Buckingham Palace, winding down the window, saying, we're here for Keir's knighthood. <laughs> it's a sort of security, but pretty non that the... <laughs> That the corgis were out, and so it's just, it's just, you know. And in the end, I think they cajoled one of the staff to sort of look after the Great Dane whilst they were in watching me. But but for them, it, it was an amazing moment of real pride for them, and and very special in that respect. Because again, they would have never expected their son to be getting knighted at Buckingham Palace. It was just not something that would ever have happened. It's a vindication of all of the hopes yeah. of their. And, Parenting. And my dad in particular wasn't very good at showing pride. No. Um, and not in himself, not in us. And so it was glimpsing it first time in that that was, was really good. But as for bringing the great day, <laughs> absolutely. They, they didn't cross their mind that this would be a problem. They, they said, well, everybody loves dogs. We'll just drive the dog into Buckingham Palace and park the car up. <laughs> Let's go back to, back to school briefly, because the, the music is something that has emerged since you became better known. It's, a, it's astonishing, or if, if it was astonishing, two things. One, that you played loads and loads of different instruments to quite a high level. Guildhall School of Music, junior exhibitioner, flute, piano. It says recorder, everyone played the recorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a given. That's a, but the flute, piano and violin is rare. And you were at school with Fat Boy Slim. Yeah, Fat Boy Slim. Is that a sliding doors moment? Could you have been in the original House Martins lineup? <laughs> well, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, we, we had violin lessons together. No. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure some of the songs I was humming uh, ended up in the House Martins. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he was there. He was there. But music was a big thing for you or, 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 or more of a sort of sideline? It was a big thing, but also a sideline. Let me okay. just explain that. Um, I was reasonably good at music, and I practised hard, and that meant I improved. I then got to the Guildhall School of Music as a Saturday junior exhibitioner, and almost the moment I walked in, I realised how gifted other people were, because there was working hard and getting to a certain level, and then there's really being gifted. And, and I knew then that... Um, I couldn't take this much further. That okay. this was, I had done it through repetition practice, doing what I was told to do and getting on with it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then you work, and there were fantastic musicians there that just had something very special. 
that um, was almost beyond being taught. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know, in a sense, that was as far as I could ever take it, perhaps as far as I ever really wanted to take it. It has given me a great love of music. Do you still um, play? No, I don't. Not at all? No, not at all. Not even when Fatboy Slim comes around with his... Oh, of course, there's a bit of busking here and there. <laughs> um, but I have got a love of music out of it. I mean, I, I see this also in sport and other things. You know, mm. you can see with football, there's, there's good players, then there's really decent players, and then there's something very special. I mean, all, all sport, I think, is mm. like this as well, where there's something really special and inspirational in some people, and I saw that at the Guildhall School of Music. And quite, oh, that was the end of my music career. <laughs> well, I'm quite self-aware at 18 to, to just know that, that you don't have it, you're not... You, yeah, you could feel it with some of these people, though. They were so good. Have it's you ever felt gifted in other fields? Have you ever thought, actually, this is where I've got something special? No. Um, I've, but I've never... Th um, that's not how I think about myself. No. I don't... You know, I... I'm a great one for getting on with the job, working out what the problem is, sorting the problem out, fixing it, and getting on with it, um, rather than thinking about whether I'm gifted or not. Um, and so no is the answer, but mainly because it's not the sort of thing I particularly think about. I mean, I'd love to have been more gifted at football. I, you yes. Know, I, <laughs> that would be a, a fantastic career. Um, I, I asked because your legal career, which we'll get to shortly, was, was I, I mean, stellar, really. The rise through the ranks of, 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 of the law was, I mean, turbocharged. But we'll, we'll get to that later because it's Leeds University next. Yeah. I love Leeds. I love going to Leeds University. It was an amazing thing because you have to appreciate where my mum and dad lived. It's on the Surrey-Kent border. It's very rural. This is... Um, somewhere where some people are commuters and many people aren't. And if right. you're not, London seems a long, long way away. Mm. And to go from that rural community, um, you know, village, Hurst Green, a town, Oxted, to the city of Leeds was amazing, eye-opener. It was just incredible. I remember driving up the 200 um, you know, miles there and just going to a city, a whole new world opened to me. Um, of experiences, of city life, of people from across the country in a way that I couldn't have imagined. It was really... And, and I've loved Leeds ever since. I try to go back to Leeds as often as I can. And I lived there for three years and loved every minute of it. But it was such a... It was, and this, you know, this is what I had that my parents didn't have because they were born and brought up in Waldingham and they lived in um, her screen, which is two stops on the train mm. down the line. Um, and my sisters have tended to stay close. That's what you did in family in, you know, in the countryside, in rural. And, but to go 200 miles and go to a university and to go to a city was amazing. And, and, and you... curry chips. I'd never <laughs> had curry chips. And, and within about a week, somebody had introduced me to curry chips and leaves. It's like mind blowing. <laughs> These are the milestones <laughs> in the your big life. Thing, <laughs> and you were, by the sounds of it, perfectly comfortable moving away from home for the first time. You didn't I was really glad with to. that. I wanted yes. to. Yeah, <laughs> all those dogs and donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Have a room on my own. It was great. And you're aware of horizons, I think, because of your parents' expectations and because of the school you were at. You're aware that the world is bigger than Oxted. Yeah, and that came through in Leeds. I hadn't still worked out what I really wanted to do. Well, if I'd asked you then, if I'd met you in, in Leeds, perhaps in my grandma's pub, the Market Tavern, I could have said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, I, when, I, 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 when I got to Leeds, I really don't think I knew much about what being a lawyer really meant. Um, as I said, I'd never met Done one. science at A-level, I think, hadn't you? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I'd never met a lawyer. I'd never been in a lawyer's office. I'd never been in the courtroom. So I didn't really know what I was mm. letting myself in for. And it was only as the three years of the degree sort of unwound that I realised I was very interested in the law, for starters. I went on to do another year at doing a Bachelor of Civil Law at Oxford University. That so must went, have meant a lot to your mum and dad as well, going to Oxford University. It did. Um, it made me realise... Uh, what a privilege it is to go to somewhere like Oxford. Mm. It was, a, you know, it was a very different experience to other universities, I have to say. Um, but at that stage, I was then beginning to think I wanted to become a barrister and wanted to be the one arguing in court. Um, uh, but it, it took a bit of time for me to work that through. And I'd been introduced, probably in the second year at Leeds, to 
international human rights law and became absolutely fascinated with this idea of what happened at the end of the Second World War after the horrors um, of Nazi Germany, um, where the world came together and asked itself, how do we stop this ever happening again? Um, and a whole new generation of human rights was born. Because human the idea that you protect human rights has obviously been around for centuries. But it had never been universal. Mm. And it had never been that each country owes it to other countries to enforce human rights. So um, the idea that internationally we had to build a whole system of protection to deal with something like that horror, I, I found fascinating. And it is what pushed me into doing you know, uh, international human rights law rather than other forms of law. This idea, how, how, does, how does a world come together and sort of solemnly agree that this must never happen again? And of all the rights, people say, well, what's the most important right then, Kira, is it the right to life, freedom mm. of expression, etc. The word in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the first instrument agreed after the Second World War, that's always leapt off the page to me is dignity the dignity of the individual, because that dignity was stripped away from millions of people um, you know, in and before the Second World War. And so that took me into a place at Leeds and then into Oxford of thinking, well, where do I want to take this? And into becoming a barrister rather than becoming a solicitor, which I could easily have done. And frustrating at all then to be in an era now where the the rhetoric about human rights has become quite negative and now quite possibly with the people on the other side of the House of Commons, even the policy making. Totally misunderstood and yeah. the history isn't properly revered. Mm. This was a very important moment in the world. If you care about genocide, and obviously you know, vast majority of people do, you can't just say you do, you've got to do something about it. You've got to have some infrastructure that means that um, we have protections for everybody wherever they are and whatever the circumstances. Um, so the misunderstanding of it is frustrating in politics. It was a very important driver in the, in the resolution of the troubles in Northern Ireland, um, this idea of how you give dignity to two communities that have been in a fierce conflict. But that meant a lot to me. And it, it steered me into, well, how do I, how do, if I'm going to be a lawyer, what do I want to do? And it, that's what made me think, I want to fight against injustice. I want to see if I can use this thing called law to change things, to change the way we are. It, it, it's, I could choose my words carefully, lofty ambition. It's a lofty ambition for, for, for a boy from your background. Possibly. I didn't see it that way. Clearly I not. Just, um, this was a journey of exploration. But I've got a, the analogy I'd use is that some mountains seem so huge that we don't even bother treading in the foothills of them. Yeah. Whereas you might have chosen battles that you could more easily win. I mean, this is, this is epochal uh, uh, hope, isn't it? Yes, and once I've started on the mountain, I want to get up it yeah. to the top. Um, and that's been a pattern through my life. And, and did but you also fixing it. I mean, it, it, this was as a lawyer, but also now in politics. There are so many people who can look at a problem and very articulately walk around it and talk about it and say, there's a problem. This is terrible. Look at this. Look at this. This is. Look at this. This mm. is terrible. I'm going to do a brilliant speech about how terrible this is. Um, and they are brilliant speeches. But if you don't fix it, you're walking around it. You're walking around it. And so I've always had this thing that if, if there's an injustice or a wrong, the job is to fix it, not just talk about it. Identify it. Work out what needs to be done, and then fix it. And that was the approach I took in law. And it's the approach I now take in politics. You've just trashed my entire career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and quite right, too. <laughs> quite right, too. And is there a moment, or I mean, obviously not a, not a second or anything like that, but where you, where you felt you'd found your groove? So perhaps a slight rephrasing of the question about being gifted. You got a first at Leeds. You went on to do a master's at Oxford. Did you, did a sense of destiny. Did you think, this is what I'm here to do? No. OK. Again. <laughs> uh, I just approached each challenge as it came along and thought, what do I, where do I need to go from here with this? 
And, and the, you know, now I look back, I can see things that, again, I, won't, I wouldn't claim necessarily to have seen at the time. Mm. You start as a lawyer, you start with individual cases. You've got a client, you're representing your client, whatever it may be, and you don't get to choose your clients. Um, so you do get a lot of challenges. But then, of course, I thought, well, we've got to do strategic litigation, not just for this client, but anybody in the same position as them. And one of the types of cases I hadn't expected to deal with was the death penalty. Yes. I mean, I'd worked out we don't have the death penalty in this country anymore. Even not knowing anything about the law, I knew that had gone. Mm. What I didn't know was that if you are in a former colony, particularly in the Caribbean, you have still, as of right, the ability to appeal to judges in London as your final right of appeal. So suddenly, seven or eight years into being a lawyer, I was asked to represent someone who was on death row in the Caribbean in front of judges in London. Now, obviously, these people have got no money, therefore there's no payment for this, and therefore only some lawyers would take these cases up. And that then shaped me again, because I became fascinated with the history of how does a former colony that's got its independence still want this right of, in, of appeal to judges in London? This seems odd. Mm. Um, and then I was doing individual cases for people on death row, and a group of us said, we've got to have some strategic thought here. We need to build teams, we need to go to the Caribbean, work to, with lawyers out there to challenge um, the death penalty as a sort of constitutional issue rather than just on a case-by-case -case basis. So that took me on to the next stage. From there, having sort of got into strategic litigation, I then began to think through in my mind, well, what would happen if instead of challenging from the outside, um, I was to work on the inside? And a job came up working with the police... Um, service in Northern Ireland, um, where, as part of the Good Friday Agreement, the old Royal Ulster Constabulary was being transformed in the police service of Northern Ireland. Really interesting concept, this, because the Royal Ulster Constabulary didn't have any Catholics, therefore it didn't want, um, really represent both communities. So the challenge was change the organisation, call it a service, not a police force, police service, not a police force, make it transparent and make all communities have faith in it. And my job was to go and help implement some of the pattern um, Good Friday Agreement um, aspects of that in relation to policing. And in doing so, learn that if you do get inside an organisation, working with the police, with the policing board, you can also change things, sometimes just as profoundly and often quicker than litigating from the outside. So that was a big step into... Um, a very important body, and a really enjoyable time as well, by the way. This was real progress in Northern Ireland. It was an amazing thing to be part of, um, the creation of a police service that would have the confidence of both communities in Northern Ireland. I loved working in Northern Ireland. I still love being there. Um, then that took me into becoming Director of Public Prosecution. You skipped the bit where you became a QC at 39. Oh, yeah, there was that, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, <laughs> But then, then into becoming the head of Crown Prosecution Service and Director of Public Prosecutions, where I had eight or 9,000 staff. But again, working within a big organisation and learning how do you bring about change in the criminal justice system then um, with the ability that you have with staff all over um, uh, England and all over Wales. And, and that eventually took me towards the political end, which is, look, there's only so much you can do within an organisation if you really so want that's, to So that's the cycle of your life, isn't so, it? So it's, 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 that's the sort of... If right. there is a thread going through, that is the thread. But it wasn't predestiny. It wasn't something I thought, this is the route no. that will get me to where I want to be. It was just taking each challenge as it came, working out how I thought we could solve the problem that was in front of us. And... Um, moving on, but never going back. I never wanted to go back. Once I'd done strategic litigation, I never wanted to go back to individual cases. Okay. Once I'd worked within um, and with the police, I didn't want to go back to litigating from the outside. I wanted to continue to work um, with them about the change. Same with uh, Crown Prosecution Service and into politics. How um, important was remuneration to you throughout this period? I mean, were, were, you, were you conscious of wanting to be more financially secure than... Not particularly. No. I mean, some lawyers have paid a lot of money. Sure. Not all. No. Um, there are many obviously. that aren't, particularly younger lawyers. Um, but I was being paid money that my parents couldn't have dreamt of. Right. And therefore, I was able. All of the death penalty work we did was all for free. Um, so you know, sometimes up to half of my time was done on free cases. I don't say this. This is not self-glorification mm. or anything. I mean, it was just the way it was. 
But it was, you know, I was lucky. The sort of money that I could be paid as a lawyer was money my parents could not dream of. And therefore, um, you know, I was comfortable and I didn't, I wasn't motivated just by making as much money as possible because otherwise I did other things. Yes. So it's a bonus. So you're doing work that you love. You make the law sound more alive than many people can. There's nothing dusty. You see it as a, as a, as a living, breathing agent of change. Oh, it's an incredibly alive thing. Let, let me give you two examples just from when I was TPP, which have really influenced me. The first was, um, soon after I became Director of Public Prosecutions, a file came onto my desk in relation to a woman who had taken her son to Dignitas because he wanted to commit suicide. Um, he had been a brilliant rugby player that had a terrible accident when the scrum collapsed on him um, in Nuneaton and had terrible, terrible, terrible injuries, basically nothing from the neck down. He was in Stoke Mandeville for six or nine months and there was nothing they could do and they eventually discharged him to live the rest of his life in a state where he couldn't use his, mm. any of his limbs at all, a, a, any of his functions. He couldn't eat, he couldn't toilet himself, etc., etc. And he was in his 20s. Uh, but his life expectancy was ordinary male life expectancy because um, the injuries didn't affect how long... It, and this drove him to complete despair and rightly or wrongly to a point where he wanted to take his own life. Um, and he didn't know how to because he couldn't, <laughs> because he couldn't use any of his limbs. So um, the only way would be, this is his own analysis, was to starve himself or to get to Dignitas. His mum was distraught, as every mother would be, absolutely distraught, argued with him uphill and down Dale that he shouldn't do it. Um, tried to you know, put videos on of his rugby games, get his mates around, anything. Um, and over the months and years, that didn't work. And eventually, he said, I'm going to go, and I want you to be with me. And she didn't know what to do. And she went with him, um, because he wanted her to. And then, even then, she couldn't go through with it, because she couldn't watch what was going to happen. She got back feeling she'd let him down and all the rest of it, immediately to be arrested for assisting suicide. Gosh. And this was the case where I had to decide, well, do we prosecute this or do we say there are countervailing factors here? I took the decision it shouldn't be prosecuted because it wasn't in the public interest. This was not a woman who was trying to gain anything from this. It was a grieving mother who absolutely didn't want it to happen. That then led to an outcry. There ought to be guidelines on assisted suicide. And we did a big consultation. And the interest in assisted suicide... Whatever your people do have strong views, obviously, um, in different places. Mm. The interest was very human. I mean, people have they think about what would I do if my parents were in such a state that um, one of them wanted to commit? How would I approach that? What would I do myself? So that's a very human thing. Um, the other case that's etched on me and affected me in the sense of influence me, was um, a case of um, a young woman called Jane Clough. And Penny and John Clough, Jane's parents were at the Labour Party conference last year. So Jane was a nurse um, up in the northeast, and she got together with a man who um, was violent towards her. Um, and um, there was lots of domestic abuse. She didn't tell anyone. She definitely didn't tell her parents. She just started wearing long sleeves um, and covering herself so that nobody could really see the effects of it. Um, and this is not unusual. This is, this is one of the things about domestic violence we don't understand, um, abuse that we don't understand. She didn't tell anyone. Um, her parents were worried. Eventually, um, she fell pregnant by this man and he raped her during the pregnancy. And... When her little girl was born, she realised she had to tell somebody because she needed to protect her little girl. Mm. So she was thinking of her little girl rather than herself. She went to her mum, went to the police. He was arrested um, and uh, wrongly released on bail. And uh, eventually he stalked her in the car park of her hospital and stabbed her over 70 times to death. 
And so her parents, John Penny, went through this absolute trauma, which reveals so much about domestic violence, sexual violence, in terms of human behaviours and why people don't come forward when you might think they would, how the criminal justice system doesn't work very well. John and Penny had to endure being at court in the canteen, not knowing what was really going on. And they first wanted to see me to complain that the criminal justice system had let them down badly, because in the end, um, the person who did this was sentenced, but not all of the rapes were taken properly into account. Mm. And this really, really hurt um, John and Penny. And they came to see, they wanted to see me to complain about what had happened. And my staff said to me, Keir, you can't see every one of these cases. You know, it's just, you don't have time. Mm. I said, if I haven't got time, to see the parents of someone whose daughter has been murdered. What on earth am I doing in this job? So we arranged to see them, and they were going to come down on a particular day. Um, and on the day that they were supposed to travel down, my own daughter was born a little bit early. So I had to tell them that I couldn't see them to talk about their daughter, because my daughter had just been born. It was just this incredibly emotional moment for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they did come and see me. They told me what was wrong. I listened. We then changed. We, I agreed at the end of the meeting. I said, we're going to, this business of not walking around the problem, so we're going to change the law here. We need to campaign to change the law to make sure people can't be released on bail in those sorts of circumstances. And we sat down and we did that. And they've been running fantastic campaigns ever since. And now they're good friends of mine. But it, it'll, it, it, if ever you need to understand why domestic violence is often as it is, it's through the eyes of these sorts of cases. They're very human stories. They're about human behaviour. And the determination I then took out of that to change the way we deal with violence against women and girls um, was profound. Because the system was, was just set up wrong. Um, it was almost... It was impenetrable, so hard to reach if you were a victim of sexual um, uh, violence, um, particularly in a relationship. So hard to reach that we just had to do something about it. So these things are very human. You, you, you know, the law... Clearly. P people say, well, I mean, the Prime Minister sort of most of the time berates me for being a lawyer, although yeah. I think he's hired one just recently. <laughs> um, <laughs> just one. <laughs> <Sorry, God. laughs> There's probably needs more than one. Yeah, one also, that's not what you told me last week. No, the coach, <laughs> coach load. These parties that... Why that does exist. this... Why will this be surprising most people in the room? Why, why are we not more aware of your achievements as, uh, as DPP, of, of meaningful changes that you've made to the fabric of our society? Be I don't, because I have tended in life to just get on with it. Yeah, but now you're trying to become Prime Minister. No, now as I, I, <laughs> no, 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 this is back to where we started. Yeah. It, is, it is a, I, I completely understand why, if you want to be Prime Minister, people will want to know understandably know what do you stand for, what are your policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what are you going to do for the country? But also a different question, which is much more penetrating, which is who are you? Yeah. What sort of a person are you? What things mattered to you on the journey of life? What did you do with your life? When, when you, what sort of decisions did you make along the way? Mm. Um, and I do accept that... Um, for those reasons, it is important to have a discussion It doesn't like come this. comfortably to you, though. Does it? Because what I'm suggesting is you need to boast a bit more. Yeah. I, I'm available for coaching. So. <laughs> I mean it, though. Yeah. Because you, 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 these, these, these are not meaningless baubles. These are, these are profound achievements that paint a very different picture from the one that gets painted by, as you've just mentioned, by your enemies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I accept that's... There's, there is more, and that is important in politics. People do need to know well, what sort of a person are you, what drives you. Well, not just that. I'm talking about the, 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 the things that made you have that sense of achievement when you were DPP or when you were a barrister. Uh, you've translated it tonight in a way that's incredibly immediate and accessible. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit surprised, and I do this for a living, you know? Yeah. We should do this more often. Well, we just, <laughs> I'm hoping you'll be too busy soon. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, now, now we are pretty much up against the, the, the bits of your life that are already 
in the public eye. But I must ask, given the context of what we've just discussed, how hurtful, if that's the right word, it was when Johnson lied about your role in the Jimmy Savile prosecutions. And how annoying it must be to have to answer the questions about it because it inflates the it, lie in a way. It was a new loaf yes. for a man for whom I've got almost no regard. <laughs> and, uh, and I... You know, um, I think um, I think this is a home fixture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I'm I'm not. I, I just yeah. put that in context. Now I'm not one of these people say you know all Labour brilliant, all Tories bad by definition, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Obviously there are ideological differences, political differences, value differences that we all have, and that's why I'm in the Labour Party. That's why I'm leading the Labour Party. I'm very proud and privileged to do so. But I would concede that Theresa May, for all the other faults she may have had, was a woman who knew that you didn't stand at the dispatch box and lie. Mm. Um, and, and, and when he did that relationship to Jimmy Savile, he knew what he was doing. There has been this right-wing mm. Nazi, um, you know, fascist um, conspiracy going round. He knew exactly what he was doing. And I knew once he'd done it, was, there was no way he was ever going to apologise. It was an irrelevant question because to apologise, you have to have the self-reflection of knowing what integrity is. And he hasn't got it. Mm. And it you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Which... Um, and that's... And, and just... Um, yeah. A lot of... I can... There aren't many advantages of being the dispatch box. Um, if you haven't been to Parliament, get along there and have a look at it and let me know when you're coming. But <laughs> it's a very small place. You step forward. And I, now this sounds balmy because you think it's obvious, but it isn't until you do it. You step forward and every friendly face is now behind you. And all you've got is a wall of <laughs> op the opposition. But it makes you quite a good reader of the mood on the other side of the house. It's quite interesting because I have to sit there the whole yeah, time, yeah, yeah. you know, very close to the Prime Minister. And I, can, I could see within his own party how uncomfortable they were with where he was taking politics. Because he was taking their party down, he was taking the country down and taking democracy down by going down this dark route um, to conspiracy theorists. And, you know, this is the party of Winston Churchill um, that now has a prime minister that's prepared to do that and carry on doing that. And so I thought it was a really low movement. And, and could but it's it, nice to have a friendlier crowd. Isn't it? I, have friendly, friendly. Friendly. <laughs> I think it was, uh, it was two <laughs> Mondays ago. It wasn't quite so friendly. No. Um, and, and it could get worse if, if, if he's found to have lied to the House, as we saw yesterday on the television, refusing to do what would once have been a rhetorical question. If you're found to have lied to the House, will you resign? Yeah. It's a question that ought to answer itself. Well, exactly. But it won't with him. He'll cling on. Yeah. He'll be dragged out. I'm surprised at some of the people who've gone along with it. Yeah, and it's been very interesting to watch. Hasn't it? Again, particularly their front bench, because they have to go out and make a decision. Do I defend this or don't I? Mm. Do I distance myself or do I go along with it? And that's been, over the last two or three weeks, been an interesting little, as you go along the, the, the front bench, to just see what they all did in those circumstances. Did they just say, I'm going to go along with the indefensible? And some of them did. Some of them didn't. Um, and it's, mm. you can see how, how... And this is why I said... I did a speech three weeks ago, I think, when the Prime Minister was, going through the, was giving his response to the Sue Gray report, where I said that, in the end, he damages everybody who has any contact with him and brings them down, because, in the end, he puts everybody around him into this situation where they've got to make a decision which is, in, in the end, becomes about them as well as about him. Are they going to go into the gutter with him or not? Um, and he drags them into the gutter. It's incredible to reflect that you've not been in Parliament for seven years yet. And, and yeah. as, as we touched on at the beginning, you've seen all manner of declines let, let's t t and, and changes. Some of them, perhaps, are going to take generations to fix. We should talk briefly about whether or not you thought you'd made the mother of all mistakes shortly after becoming MP, you, you found yourself appointed to the Home Office Ministerial Team by Jeremy Corbyn. Um, not long after that, you found yourself resigning in protest at Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, among 
I mean, with several other Labour MPs, simply untenable now to suggest we can offer an effective opposition without a change of leader. And then you became Brexit Secretary, shadow Brexit Secretary. Did you think ever that you'd made a terrible mistake going into politics? No. No. Come on. No. Right the, <laughs> no. Um, because I, on building on this journey through life, I, yes. I got to the stage of knowing only through politics can you make a real difference. So I was trying to make a difference in criminal justice, but if you're really going to deal with, let's stick with domestic violence, you've got to think about your refugees, your support, your victim support, um, and all the rest of it. And you can't do all that within the silo that is criminal justice. It's got to be a broader piece. So I knew why I went into politics, which was because I wanted to bring about change, and I realised you couldn't do it if you didn't go into national politics. So I never regretted it. I've been deeply frustrated. Right, OK. And this is one of the big lessons for our party. We have to win elections. I know it's obvious, but we, if, if we don't win elections, we don't change lives. And Labour governments do brilliant things when they're in power, but we need to be in power to do it. And so that's driven me through the last mm. seven years and will drive me through to the next election when I hope we can actually do something about it. And, and when the opportunity came to, to run for leader, how, how long did it take you to decide that your hat was heading into that ring? I... We had a few days away, um, and I talked to friends, I talked to Vic, my wife, but um, pretty quickly made my mind up before the Christmas of um, 2019, we yeah. just lost very badly in mid-December, and then the leadership race kicked off on the 4th of January 2020. Um, and it seemed to go on forever <laughs> um, until the 4th of April that year, and that was an extraordinary thing because we started off... Um, going across the country, trying to shake as many hands as possible. The more people you could get in one room, yeah. the more people you could hug and do selfies with, the better. By the end of it, we were in lockdown. Um, and I had to do my acceptance speech in my front room. This is a, an amazing <laughs> uh, thing, because if there's one thing that keeps you going in the Labour Party leadership race, it's knowing that if you do win, you get the chance at the end to face the country, of course. to sort of, you've been facing your party, you're now going to face the country. Traditionally, it's done in a massive hall, the Queen Elizabeth Conference Hall, something like that, with thousands of people there, and the cameras, and you know, it is a moment when you emerge as leader of the Labour Party, which is an amazingly privileged thing for me, really incredible pride and privilege in myself, you know, it's one of the proudest days of my life, becoming the leader of the Labour Party. I had to do all that in my living room, <laughs> um, you know, delivering my very best to um, my furniture <laughs> with no human response at all because we were in lockdown. So it was, it was, you know, a real moment because of the history around it. But it was a really incredible moment. And you know, here's another of the differences between me and Johnson. I genuinely think leading the Labour Party is a huge privilege. Mm. Being leader of the opposition is a huge privilege. And I think that being the Prime Minister is a huge, huge privilege. You're there to serve, quite humbly, as Prime Minister. It's not a birthright. It's not a given. It's not something to be treated casually. It's an incredible privilege. Um, and, um, and that also rankles with me with this Prime Minister because he doesn't, he's not treating the office with the respect it deserves. He's treating it as if he's somehow entitled to it. And he's not. And we're going to remove him. Mm. <laughs> really, really. Uh, almost bang on time there with the, with the final round of applause. I normally end full disclosure interviews by asking my guests whether they have any ambitions left, but I think, <laughs> I think with the leader of the opposition, that's pretty bloody obvious. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'll ask something that's occurred to me in the course of the conversation this evening, which is. The, 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 there's two jobs. There's the, the, I mean, obviously, getting into power and the desire to have power in order to effect change and, and to improve things. But you also need to have that showmanship, is it? Is that the word I'm looking for? You, you, the, 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 the achievements that people in this room will have heard about for the first time tonight need to be reaching a much wider audience. The stuff that doesn't come naturally to you. How conscious are you of that as a, as a potential problem? I'm conscious of the need to do it. I'm conscious of the need to do more of it. I, this experiment mm. with a showman as Prime Minister 
isn't going well. No, not well. Um, and, uh, you know what I mean. I know what you, you know, mean, you, you but it, it's not showbiz. <laughs> It's about the serious business of changing the country. I mean, I'm really serious about this. Yes. This is why I'm doing it. It is about changing the country for the benefit of millions of people who desperately need change. As we come out of COVID, all of the inequalities and fractures in our society, which we knew were there, were exposed you know, times a million. Mm. Um, all the brilliant opportunities that um, are there as we come out of COVID um, need to be taken. And we need to harness the spirit of what we've just been through, which is by and large people looking after each other. You know, the gentle knock on the door of a neighbour that wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily have expected. Are you all right for your food? Can I get your medicines for you? The community um, banks that were set up to support people and help people. It, total opposite of Margaret Thatcher's famous old expression, there's no such thing as society. Because actually what we've witnessed in the last two years is society mm. coming together and pretty much looking after each other. We need to harness that coming out of it. So I think we've got an amazing opportunity for change. And what I want to do is bring about a change of government so we can actually bring that change about for the betterment of, of millions of people. I, I, let, me, let me rephrase. Not a showman, then a salesman. Because it doesn't matter how good the product yeah. is, you need a good salesman. Yes. And that means talking about myself more, being open. I think so. More. Do you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a, it is a, you know, all most people don't talk about themselves all the time. You should hear my show. <laughs> 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 those monologues, those famous monologues that go absolutely viral. But you're which aware are, of it. Which are brilliant, Thank as you. we all know. You, 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 no, there really are. You, you, you're aware of it. You do. Are you conscious? Because it's, it, it feels almost beneath you, perhaps. No, beneath isn't the right word. No, what is? Um, I, in my own head, I'd be saying, Kia, this isn't important. Right. What's important is the next challenge that you've got to yes. deal with. And I know that sounds very methodical, um, but I am, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fix, I want to fix problems and make things change for the better. And so for me, it's not beneath me. It's just, um, as I say, I've mm. never thought that that's an important thing. That is what I've done with my life. Um, but I need to talk more about it. <laughs> Keir Starmer, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs>